So without further ado, I'd like to thank Val and hand over to Val. Thank you so much, uh, John. I'm going to get started with my um, both text and voice here. And I hope all of you will be as excited about some of the things I'm going to talk about today as I am, because digital citizenship is a fascinating topic and it's uh, personally relevant. So um, today the topic is meta literacy for digital citizens. And um, as John said, I'm Dr. Valerie Hill. I've been researching virtual environments for 14 years with a focus on changing literacy because the information revolution has completely turned literacy and our lives upside down. And that happened during my career as a librarian. So I'm the director of the Community Virtual Library here in Second Life. And I hope all of you can hear me. There are some parcel lines around here, and if I cross them, you might not hear me. So would you type a Y in the text chat if you're able to hear me right now? And I'll make sure that everyone can hear. I'm seeing some Ys. That's terrific. Our, um, our website, you can look on our website to see when we have librarians on duty at the Community Virtual Library. You can look under reference and see more information at our website. So I'll put that in the text chat. I also am happy to give tours of the Community Virtual Library because it's a real library in a virtual world. I've taught at all grade levels and served as a school librarian for 20 years and then um, a college professor of information science. So changing literacy impacts all of us, me, you, all of us that are here. And there's now a need for us to take a new look at what literacy is in digital culture. And it's what I like to call meta-literacy. And that's literacy uh, that requires juggling lots of formats, uh, physical, and digital. Uh, meta literacy is literacy in all different kinds of formats because books are no longer the top priority in for literacy, as most of you know. Okay, so I'm going to sit down on my next slide here and talk a little bit about prosumers. So Alvin Toffler is the one who coined this term, prosumer. He's a futurist. And he saw years ago that things were changing and that individuals were beginning to create and share content themselves. Sometimes I like to say that students are producing and putting online more content, content than they're actually consuming and downloading because it goes both ways. Um, I, I know when I was teaching um, at a uh, elementary school, many of the students had their own YouTube channel, and they were fifth graders 10 years old, uh, putting their Minecraft videos on YouTube. Um, type a Y in the text chat if you have a YouTube channel. Some of you may. Um, and that's, that's being a prosumer. You are both consuming and producing content. But you're also doing it on social media, on many other apps where you um, put things online. So we are all both producers of information and consumers of information, which makes us prosumers, what we call user-generated content. I like to say the information hierarchy that I grew up in has toppled. Book used to be the king of the hierarchy of information, but that's no longer true. We have far more user-generated content than we do traditional media in formats like, in formats like books. In fact, I mentioned YouTube. It's become the number one source of information on the planet. You want to know how to change your um, pipes under your sink? Oh, I'm sure there's a YouTube video for that. It's become kind of a do-it-yourself um, culture with everyone sharing how-to videos. So we're all prosumers, and I'm going to move over to my next slide, which shows a photo of Alvin Toffler, the man who I said came up with the term prosumers. Love this quote by Alan Toffler because it really shows that literacy has changed. 
Alvin Topher, Toffler uh, liked to put it this way. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And to me, that when you think about it, how many of you have ever found that just when you learn a certain app, the whole interface changes? Or just when your operating system, you've got it set up the way you want, you get a new operating system or a new update. Or you're slowed down by coming into Second Life because here comes another update. You have to unlearn and relearn. That is literacy in digital culture. It's a constant oscillation sort of a swinging back and forth between new formats and old, between producing content and consuming content. And this swinging back and forth, oscillating between physical and digital formats, it aligns to our philosophical moment, which I call metamodernism. Now, I'm not the only person. I didn't make this up. If you look up metamodernism, I've done quite a bit of research on it. You'll see that there are many that are calling our current era in time metamodernism. Some of you are probably familiar with postmodernism. Well, that's over. But a lot of times you can't really name the moment you're in until we move through it. But many are leaning towards calling our philosophical moment metamodernism. And they're beginning to adopt that name for our current era. Acquiring knowledge in the past meant you climbed a ladder toward final mastery. You learned something, you got it down, you own it, and you get better and better. That's not the way it works anymore. And I work with a lot of elderly people. They hate this because things keep changing. In metamodern culture, we learn new tools and apps constantly while evaluating live information and adapting to new devices and software updates all the time. Older people say in their 80s that I work with or their 90s, they don't like that constant stream of information coming at them that you never ever get to the end. They're used to that hierarchy where you finally master something. How many of you have uh, maybe you're too long to, young to remember how it used to be, but how many of you agree that your stream of incoming information never ends? It's always coming at you, so you really never finalize keeping up with incoming information. Type a Y in the text chat if you kind of um, agree with that statement that information is nonstop, 24-7 in our culture today. Great. I see that you're on the same wavelength about um, information coming nonstop. There's no end to the incoming stream of information. And my book, Metamodernism and Changing Literacy, addresses not only that challenge, but many other challenges that we face due to the changes of literacy today. And I will not cover all of them today. I'm focusing mostly on digital citizenship and how it relates to us each personally. I feel it's imperative that we each understand our personal responsibility as digital citizens. I used to ask my um, parents in the school library when they'd come to say an open house night in the library. So parents, how old do you think your um, child is or will be when they become a digital citizen? I was surprised because many parents said, I'd say around fourth grade, maybe nine or 10 years old. And then I would tell them, actually, it's earlier than that. Many of you have posted online sonograms of your baby before birth. <laughs> Digital citizenship can start at birth or even before because we're all online all the time. And it really opened up their minds to the fact that even young toddlers, everyone is now a digital citizen. So I'm gonna move over to this slide about meta-literacy and, and what is that term and why have I chosen to adopt it? Well, as I was researching our changing literacy, I stumbled on this word. Mackey and Jacobson. Thomas Mackey wrote the foreword in my book, and I've talked with him a lot about his work with meta-literacy. He coined the term to help us better understand how we can be literate now in digital culture 
as prosumers. And it's essential to digital citizenship to understand meta-literacy. Whether you've heard of the word or not, you still need to be meta-literate. And I wrote a guest blog post for um, the meta-literacy blog. You can bookmark that and read it later um, to talk about meta-literacy and how we're doing this in a virtual world. All of you right now are being meta-literate. You're juggling all kinds of literacy formats right now with your camera as you look at my avatar, look at my slides, listen to my voice, Look at the text chat. You are, you are juggling many formats of literacy. You're being meta-literate. And you can zoom in on this slide and see there's a circle on the meta-literacy slide that shows the meta-literate learner plays lots of roles. You can be a communicator, a translator, an author, a researcher, a publisher, in, in also in various ways, in cognitive ways where you're thinking about your thinking, metacognitive, um, and the way you feel about it, the effective domain, all of this, uh, that chart sort of shows you a bit more about meta-literacy. And you play those roles as both consumer and producer of content. So I like to put it this way, the internet has connected everyone and it's given everyone a voice, but not everything, not everybody has anything meaningful to add to the conversation. That's part of digital citizenship, knowing when to participate and when to keep quiet. You know that I love to tell the students, think before you post. I'd like you to put a Y in the text chat if you have ever encountered some information that you thought was either unnecessary, unkind, or too much information when you were looking online, too personal, things that you really didn't need to know or see, and now you can't unsee it. I see many of you are agreeing. It, there, it's not always something that you should share that people are sharing. And it gets difficult for us as prosumers because we bump into that a lot. So the internet's become a flood of information that is impossible to navigate without meta literacy. And once we understand what that means, what it means to be prosumers and participants in digital culture, well, unless you're a hermit and you live high up in the mountains and you have no internet connection at all, every single one of us are participants in digital culture and we become aware of the need for digital citizenship. And I'm gonna stand up and move over to the wheel here, the digital citizenship wheel. As I mentioned, everyone has a voice online, but not everything shared is good or meaningful. And certainly not everything we encounter online is true. In fact, Mackie and Jacobson, the researchers who have, um, I've really followed that coined that term meta-literacy, uh, they, they believe that we live in a post-truth world where getting to the bottom of facts and truth has become difficult, if not sometimes impossible. The many elements of digital citizenship, they're really beyond the scope of this short talk today. This is just an overview of the need for digital citizenship and meta literacy. So you can kind of contemplate that on your own and think about your own responsibility in digital culture. And if you zoom in on this wheel, you can see that it, it encompasses a lot of concepts from digital rights digital literacy or meta-literacy, communication, emotional intelligence, of course, security, cybersecurity has become critical, digital safety, digital identity, which also uh, relates to avatars, um, digital use, all of these concepts are part of digital citizenship. And becoming meta-literate helps you understand your personal responsibility for being aware of all these different elements. So um, these, this wheel covers the ethical use of information. As I said, cybersecurity, safety, all of these things. And I'll put the uh, link to the, uh, the DQ Institute where this came from. The Community vir Virtual Library, you're, you're standing in the part of the library today. Our main building is on the other side of the sim. We also are, are active in other virtual worlds. We have a digital citizenship museum 
in Kitely, if you've heard of the virtual world Kitely. And then we have branches in other virtual worlds besides Second Life. So later you could contact me if you're interested in digital citizenship and would like to visit our digital citizenship museum in another virtual world. So I mentioned I was a school librarian for 20 years and what was really exciting is that during my time as a school librarian, the hierarchy of information toppled, and I like to say I witnessed the close of the Gutenberg parentheses. Imagine a bracket of parentheses where the Gutenberg area was in between from 1500 when the Gutenberg press was you know, first uh, used to about the year 2000, and then that closed. 500 years, that's over. Book is no longer king. The Gutenberg era closed right while I was a librarian. No more encyclopedias. The kids loved seeing those old encyclopedias and giant dictionary, which libraries aren't going to purchase anymore. A little fourth grader came in my library and I was showing her how to look something up in a great big dictionary one day in the early 2000s. And she said, why didn't we just Google it? I said, you're right. Why walk all the way down the hall, flip through this great big book when you can just Google it from your pocket? That's over. No more encyclopedias. But I want to ask a question. Please type your answer in the text chat. How many of you still enjoy reading a book in print sometimes? Uh, type a Y if you, if you do. Because print books, are they're not going away. It is a really cool format that I think is always going to be around, even though I do appreciate and I love ebooks. But there is something for the classics and a really cool edition that is, uh, it's nice to read in print. And, uh, and electricity goes out or, uh, you know, you run out of batteries. <laughs> uh, print has its advantages. So um, I think they'll, they'll most likely always be around, but we can also use, and if you zoom in on this slide that I'm, where I'm sitting, this is some of the things we have to juggle. Websites, ebooks, e-readers, changing formats of all of these, databases, videos, podcasts, blogs, and millions of apps. As well as evolving virtual worlds, I have a VR headset. I've been researching VR for a year, and it makes me like Second Life even more because there's disadvantages with a headset. But all of these that we balance are part of literacy, particularly meta-literacy. And uh, juggling them all, sometimes simultaneously, is actually changing the human brain. I talk about that a little bit in uh, my book, How the Human Brain could be changing because of all the, the digital tools we're using. So this is part of digital citizenship. And you know, one can get sucked away by the stream of social media into a self-absorbed whirlpool. <laughs> and so, um, you know, we have to be cautious of how we set up our own worlds of incoming digital media. And there's more about that in my book a whole chapter on the dark side of digital culture. I'm not going to get into that today, but we do have to learn how to juggle and how to choose the best digital tools for whatever purpose we want. And we also have to juggle between multiple realities, the physical world, the virtual world, and augmented reality, which is posed to really impact society in the next few years. Choosing that best space for a specific purpose for working or gaming or social interaction or learning or whatever, that is a meta-literacy skill. And it's a balancing act that uh, is now our personal responsibility. And I keep wanting to say that again and again, because it's you personally that have to do this. Nobody else can do it for you. Meta-literacy meta is indeed a balancing act. So I'm going to talk for just a minute about this word metamodernism, which I love, and I, I just keep um, trying to find more research. There's um, a, a PhD um, guy in um, the Netherlands that I've worked with. He wrote a second forward to my book, and he's one of the people who's written and researched a lot about metamodernism. The in, as I said, the information revolution has changed literacy 
forever. There's no going back. And we do live in a fascinating, fast-paced time, no matter what you call it. But I've adopted this term, metamodernism, whenever I discuss our current philosophical era. Although I mentioned there are other names in the running, some people like to call our current era, our current moment in time, post-postmodernism. But I think that sounds a little bit redundant, um, but that's one other term that people are, um, are kind of talking about. But I present this topic today right here in what some people like to call the metaverse, a place where metadata constructs a simulation of reality. So think about that. We're standing here inside a metaphor for our world. And as, a, as, you, as we think about that, you are using metacognition. You're thinking about your own thinking. So I'm using a lot of meta words, meta, 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 you know, meta modernism, meta literacy, but I think they fit. You know, they, they fit, that prefix really fit, fits because the simulation is about the reality. And metamodernism spirals through both the traditions of the past and balances an oscillation of swinging through history, the past, the present, and the future, back and forth. And I strive as a virtual world librarian to balance innovation, the rich tradition of the history of libraries in the past, with innovation. That's metamodernism, oscillating between history, you know, tradition and innovation, not just throwing everything away and bringing on the new. That was kind of a modern idea. Bring, make it new, make it new. That was Ezra Pound's you know, thing way back at the turn of the, the 19th century to the 20th century. But now we realize we don't want to throw away history. So metamodernism is a really cool um, thing to sort of look at. And I'm on a slide now that just shows that metamodernism isn't just literacy. It's everything. It's art, music architecture, all of it is changing in digital culture, all of it. So I put a little, um, just a little bit of art right here. Claude Monet, you know, the Impressionists were in the early 1900s. And then Christopher Wool had the, some cool, you know, postmodernism coming out in the mid to late 1900s. And you can look up David, David Thorpe if you want to see some art that's current, that's metamodernism. And in my book, I talk about architecture and even music as it changes into more metamodernism. Um, so that's kind of beyond the, uh, the literacy scope, but I wanted you to realize that literacy is but part of metamodernism. It includes the ways that we express ourselves in our cultural era, through art, literature, music. So that, that's part of what my book stresses, the importance of learning history as well as um, the future. And I did mention it's not a fully adopted term, and you know we may end up calling it something else. But whatever we call it, times have changed. So I'm going to sit over here and and just have you zoom in on this slide about learning environments, because here you are in a virtual learning environment, nothing like the one on the top left there, um, where students worked years ago. You are using meta literacy right now while I'm speaking to you. And years ago, there were traditional rows of desks where students would listen to a lecture, um, and they had to be together in a, in a physical space in order to discuss. But now we um, have evolved into virtual spaces and augmented reality. You'll see a, a tablet there on the lower left showing the inside of the human body where you can interact with physical and virtual uh, media. And you see the top right, educators in VR. On my VR headset, I met with educators um, in a VR world. I found I could only be in there about 45 minutes before I felt a little queasy. So it wasn't quite as easy for me to use and adopt as Second Life. Now the pandemic has forced many educators and many learners to use new tools. And it hasn't been easy for some people who have, were not comfortable with that. It has brought some people into Second Life for the first time, and many into Second Life that had left for some time and then realized, hey, this is a great platform for learning. So many have returned. But I wanted to mention that uh, meta literacy definitely involves utilizing 
different learning environments and particularly virtual ones. Now, one more thing I wanna mention that's really important for meta-literacy is, um, is preservation of formats. It's an important part of digital meta-modern culture because look at that slide. How many of you recognize some of these old formats like the VHS tapes? Maybe when you were young, you used to watch your movies on VHS, go to the movie store and rent them. Put a Y in text chat. If you remember renting movies on either DVD or VHS, you watched them on your, and some people still do. I know some people who still have DVD players or an old cassette tape like on the on, on this screen, or the old three by five floppy disks. Some of you may be too young to remember those. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot about preservation right now, but it is an, a critical element of meta-literacy. It is essential to our future that we know how to migrate digital content into new formats. It's important not only for you as one individual, but for our country, our, na our nations of the world, because most content is born digital. The archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, um, I heard him in a conference say it keeps him up at night thinking about how to, how to migrate all of the digital content being born into new formats, because if we don't, it could be lost forever. And some people even predict we could enter the digital dark ages where much of our history is lost. Now, I'm not a dark futurist, but I am a librarian, and I understand that um, migrating formats and archival is very important for the history of mankind. So there's a whole chapter in my book about the importance of um, preservation of content. And it's important for you to think about it because the computer that you're on right now it's not going to be around forever. And MP3s, MP4s, they won't always be the, the, the top choice for videos and music. And you will learn how to adopt new formats and migrate your content into them. Um, so it's both personal and it's also important for us all. So in closing, and then I'm going to talk about, we're going to move around these slides and see if there are questions about any particular slides. In closing, I want to mention that meta-literacy, as I said, is now our current philosophical moment. And meta-literacy, so there's two takeaway words today for you, meta, 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 <laughs> meta-modernism, our current moment, and meta-literacy. Meta-literacy is it's simply a word, a term, to address literacy as prosumers. And from the meta-literacy site, here's what it says at the site. Meta-literacy promotes critical thinking and collaboration in a digital age, providing a comprehensive framework to effectively participate in social media and online communities. It's a unified construct that supports the acquisition, production, and sharing of knowledge in collaborative online communities, which is what you standing here with me today are doing. And I've got a few references on this closing slide here. Um, you'll see, I mentioned Mackie and Jacobson. If you look them up, you can find out a lot about their work in meta literacy as information um, research scientists. And I hope that you'll ponder your own responsibility for digital citizenship and maybe think critically about your own changing literacy. And if, if I walk over here, oops, I stood on, I got back on my slides here. If I walk over here to the edge of the um, ramp, I put my book here and if you click on it, you can read the two forwards I mentioned from Thomas Mackey and um, Robin Van Deniker who is in the Netherlands, as well as the table of contents that tell you about all the chapters and give a summary. That way you can see a little bit more about uh, the many things that metamodernism might relate to with literacy and changing literacy as the focus.